Welcome back to episode 3 of season 3 where I am looking at the topic of food justice. COVID-19 has simultaneously caused disruptions to the food system and brought to fore the labor force that is truly essential to our economies in addition to of course medical practitioners. Farmers, producers, growers, grocery store owners and assistants, food delivery people and many more in the supply chains are working day and night for meager returns and virtually no safety net. How do we acknowledge their labor in a way that goes beyond applause on our windows at a premeditated time? Of course, then there's the issue of what we eat. Although awareness of plant-based diets is increasing year on year, many are still not able to extend their empathy for non-human animals to human beings who are, for instance, migrant workers from BIPOC communities experiencing issues such as wage theft in the US, or farmers in India protesting against the new agricultural reforms to maintain the minimum support price system, amongst other historic issues of debt and financial stress. How do we go beyond focusing on individual behavior of swapping our meat for microgreens and rallying for food justice and equity holistically? Hello and welcome to this week's episode on Amplify. Today I am in conversation with Lauren Ornelas the founder and director of Food Empowerment Project, a food justice nonprofit working at the intersection of veganism, farm and produce worker rights, and accessibility, nutrition, and health. Lauren's career as an activist spans 30 years, and I'm so, so happy to have her on board to talk about food justice. So thank you so much for being here, Lauren. I really appreciate this. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to speak with you. Great. So Lauren, just to start off, can you talk about what got you involved in this space? Like what inspired you to become an activist and, and work within the space of food justice? Well, I think that, you know, a lot of it goes back to probably when I was really young, not quite cognizant of it though, but I would say that when I was four or five, I went vegetarian mm -hmm. because I grew up in Texas and so I would see the cows in the fields and my parents were going through a divorce around that same time. And I think that the reality of being separated from my family because my mom would have to take me places and I'd be separated from my sisters. I couldn't imagine doing that to the cows. I couldn't imagine being responsible for why that baby didn't come home to the mom or the mom didn't come home to the baby. So I think that I had empathy for what was going on. Again, not quite understanding the correlation at that age, but when I look back on it now. But I wasn't able to stick with being vegetarian because my family didn't have a lot of money. And so I had to go back to eating meat sometime. Yeah. And so I think that that was my first understanding of people not being able to eat what they want to eat, not having choices because of money. I'm also Mexican. And so I was raised with an understanding of the boycott of grapes for the farm workers. And so I think that that stuck with me as well. When I got into high school, I got involved in the anti-apartheid movement that was going on in South Africa. And mm -hmm. one of the things they were asking people to do outside of South Africa was to not buy products that were still vested in the apartheid regime. So I started boycotting companies such as Coca-Cola and other products that were still. So I think that my whole history, my background was starting to look at food as a tool for social change and a way to create positive change in the world by not only our individual choices, but how we can use our voices collectively to try to make a difference. When you started off, I mean, I don't imagine that there were a lot of people perhaps in that space as, you know, I mean, there's so much more awareness today about veganism and, and different kinds of diets and with respect to the impact that it has on our environment. But what was that space like when you started off, was it like a lonely journey? Were you, did you feel isolated in what you believed in and what you were trying to prescribe to people or spread awareness about? Definitely. And I will, be, I will admit, I still feel lonely sometimes with all of these issues that I care about that I'm waiting for people to get. But when I was in elementary school and I didn't even know what the word vegetarian was, it wasn't, you know, I grew up in Texas. This was in the 70s. So it was not really a word that people were using. But by the time I was in high school and I went vegan, yeah, it was, you know, I think I was always felt to be a little bit different than everybody else. But I do think it was lonely and it was sad because to me, it was so obvious to not want to harm another living being. 
when I didn't have to. You know, you would think it'd be so obvious to people who say they care about animals to this is one way they could stop hurting them. And so, yeah, that's a really lonely feeling. And then eventually being an animal rights activist and vegan for so long and then starting to talk about human rights abuses in the food industry, it was like the animal people didn't want to get it. The vegans didn't want to hear about farm workers who pick our produce. They didn't want to hear about slavery and child labor in the chocolate Mm -hmm. industry. They didn't want to hear it's not easy for everybody to go vegan. So yeah, there's a lot of periods of time. I think when anytime you learn something that's not the typical of the mainstream that you're around, it it can be a bit lonely. Can you also talk about how Food Empowerment Project came to be? Sure. Well, I got involved in the animal rights movement in 1987, and I started Food Empowerment Project in 2007. And during that time of being an animal rights activist, obviously a lot of my passion was dedicated to non-human animals, but in my own time, I would do things for human rights issues. But when I started to learn more about what was happening in chocolate, in 2000, I learned about child labor and slavery in the chocolate industry. And I started to talk about that more as part of my work the organization that I ran that worked on veganism. And I would also start to talk about farm workers because there was a boycott possibly being kicked off for the strawberry workers. And a lot of people in the animal rights movement told me I was hurting the animals by talking about these other issues Mm. and that I was doing them a disservice. And that was really hard for me because I felt like this is all connected. How can we separate these issues when they're one, they all revolve around food and two, they're all about exploitation and suffering. And in 2006, I spoke at the World Social Forum in Caracas, Venezuela, where I was talking about the harm that corporate animal agriculture does to the animals, the workers, and the environment. But when I was there, there were so many people, first of all, who looked like me, who were brown, who weren't white, (laughs) and they all were very passionate about some similar issues that I cared about, from water privatization, which you're familiar with in India, as well as immigration issues and labor issues. And they were talking about all these issues I really cared about. And I thought, there's no way I can just only work on issues impacting non-human animals. I need to go back and I need to start an organization where our mission is wide enough to include non-human animals, but also human animals and really address corporations and their exploitation of human, non-human animals and the land and the air and the water. Yeah. I remember that, I think it was probably around 2013, 2014, which was like, you know, Instagram had just come in, Snapchat had just come in. And so social media really propelled and helped, you know, spread awareness about what people were doing. And so when it came to movements like veganism, they really got such a massive boost because you could sort of organize around social media. And I remember at that point, like following a vegan food blogger who was just, she was British and white. And she was just like, you know, veganism is the only like cruelty free diet and is the only way to go forward if you even care about kindness or if you're an empathetic person or basically if you're a good human being. and. It's so pertinent because, you know, the veganism movement has been massively, like it's been predominantly a white movement. And then there's also this parallel narrative that veganism as a diet is cruelty free. So, I mean, like, can you just comment on why that might be a misnomer? Sure. And this is something, it's just really, you know, there's so many easier ways that we as vegans can talk about these issues without using a broad stroke, which isn't correct and people can poke holes in pretty easily. So obviously when it comes to the impact of non-human animals, for the most part, veganism is not involving the deliberate suffering of these animals, and that is wonderful. But when you look at the other foods that we consume, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, you have the farm workers who, you know, suffer from exploitation, their living conditions, their working conditions that are not paid well, the women suffer sexual harassment, Even when the fires are going on, like here, they're forced to work out in the fields. We have farm workers who die doing the work that they do to pick food for us to eat. So that certainly isn't cruelty-free. Then you look at the commodities. You look at bananas. You look at chocolate. You look at coffee. And although those may be vegan, meaning that they're not involving the harm of non-human animals, they are still involving the harm of human beings. And so therefore, it's not cruelty-free. It's not a holistic cruelty-free. And so, you know, that's something we push back on saying, you know, we can say it's not harming non-human animals, but if we want to be, have true cruelty-free and really ethical food, we need to be honest about these other issues. Even if we can't, 
especially when it comes to produce, right? I mean, it's kind of impossible. We have to have produce in order to be healthy. So it's not like we can eliminate that from our diet like we can, say, cow's milk or something. But the fact that we can eliminate it from our diet means we need to be honest about it. You know, we need to be honest that it's not cruelty-free. And here are the steps we think people can take or just at least acknowledge that we know it's not a perfect system and we should all try to do our best. I mean, some of the narrative that I was exposed to in London was just that if you are working in this supply chain to, you know, produce uh, meat and dairy, for instance, then people who work in these supply chains are essentially complicit, you know, but they're not they're not criticizing the system within which this work is happening, but rather they're just vilifying the people who are trying to, you know, make a means or a living for themselves who are doing the work within the system. Absolutely. And that's, I guess that's the part that's most disturbing is that a lot of vegans have sympathy and empathy for non-human animals, but don't extend that to the human animals who are also victims of exploitive systems. Often looking at slaughterhouse workers where we have this catch-22 where we want to, like you said, vilify them. And at the same time, we acknowledge as our 100% turnover rate in slaughterhouses. So clearly they're not staying there very long. You know, I wrote a blog recently on asking vegans to have more sympathy for or compassion for slaughterhouse workers who've been diagnosed with COVID-19. Mm-hmm. And the hate we received was frightening. You know, and again, the reality that a lot of these people are immigrants, they're threatened with deportation, they are suffering themselves in the jobs that they're doing. And ironically, some of these same workers have talked about what they do to animals and it not feeling great to them either. But there's just a limit, you know, there's just, and again, I think some of that comes from a place of privilege that they don't understand what it's like not to have options. They don't know what it's like that you have to do whatever you can to have a roof over your family's head and food on the table. And that, you know, just what people go through in this country that come from different and less privileged circumstances. Yeah. And and I think particularly because a lot of people who are working, that there is this layer of that they are immigrants, that they are black and brown people, you know, that they are people who are from low income communities, which are also overwhelmingly black and brown communities. There is that entire layer ends up happening is the white vegan movement just becomes extremely exclusive and also racist because they don't seem to understand these intersections. Yeah, no, they don't. And I think that the, the ant just to go, I don't mean to go off on too much of a tangent, but some of that you can see is what happens within the organizations that organizations don't pay very much to their employees. So therefore the only people who can work at them are going to be from some place of privilege because maybe they don't have to pay student loans. They're not worrying about giving their parents money to help them survive. That yeah. they only, you know, that they can live off of it because maybe mom and dad has money that they supplement to help them out. So you have then organizations who are, again, primarily privileged, primarily white people who are making these decisions on campaigns, but don't have a deeper understanding of what it's like for the other people in the world who don't have the same privilege. On the sort of what vegans eat side of it, right? I mean, there's a lot of recipes which are chia seed pudding or chia something or the other, or it's avocados or it's kale chips or it's chickpeas. And all of these foods are are traditionally foods that have been eaten by BIPOC communities. They have, they're extensively grown in countries, you know, like Peru and Colombia and various others. And, you know, what impact does someone, some entity such as Whole Foods, for instance, just selling chickpeas at this exorbitant price have on people who grow these chickpeas and have relied on it for so many years to sustain them, to to help them live essentially and and be healthy. Yeah, I think that's the interesting thing. Again, this (laughs) interesting view that vegans have on the world as if it's something that they, white vegans created Mm -hmm. without recognizing that brown and black people around the globe have been eating primarily, but somewhat plant-based. Yeah. But yeah, these products then that people are used to eating all the time then become commodities. And we saw this a bit with quinoa, you know, to where now we got to make sure that, you know, it's not this food that it's going to be too costly for people to be able to eat in their homelands. And that's why one of the things we've encouraged is really people making sure that when they're buying it, that there's some something that gives back to the community, something that gives back to the farmer, something that gives back to the countries versus again, another commodity being created and then it being harder for people. You know, I think to skip a little bit to COVID, that was one of the interesting things that you saw during the, well, we still have the pandemic, but when everybody was in this uh, stay in place order, that you had 
people going into more ethnic grocery stores and mm. buying the foods there because they weren't available in their regular grocery stores anymore than leaving those people in those communities without the foods that they were used to being able to buy. And, you know, again, then all of a sudden everybody kind of understood what it was like not to have access to the foods that they were used to buying. Yeah. In a weird way created, you would like to think some type of understanding of what it feels for black and brown and indigenous people in this country all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And moving on a little bit, I guess, to the, to the access part of it, which I know is another key area that your organization and that your activism focuses on, you know, and just to sort of contextualize the issue, can we just start off with what food deserts are so that listeners sort of know where we're headed with this? <laughs> Sure. So food desert is a term created by the USDA. So that's the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Mm -hmm. where they look at lack of access to healthy foods as primarily a proximity issue. Right. That people are are a bit further away from grocery stores. And it's also areas where you have higher rates of dietary diseases. So you have more liquor stores and more convenience stores than you have grocery stores. Food Empowerment Project embraces the fact that we need to be using the term food apartheid to look at this issue. Instead of calling it food deserts, let's call it what it is. And it's about systemic racism, about discrimination. It's about lack of living wages for Black and Brown and Indigenous people. In our work, what we found is that the biggest barrier isn't necessarily a proximity issue. It's a matter of people not being able to afford the healthier food. Right. That's not to say that there's a lot of grocery stores in the community because there aren't. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But people are primarily buying the food that they can buy at convenience stores and liquor stores. Right. These people are also many times time poor and cash poor, which yeah. means that they don't have a lot of time to cook a lot of these healthy foods, that they are possibly working multiple jobs to keep ends, their ends meet so that they can keep their family surviving. So, you know, the USDA term is just very lacking in a fuller perspective. And I think that when you look at the government, they're not always going to be open-minded to discuss racism and things like that. Yeah. And I mean, I went through the differentiation that the very deliberate differentiation that your organization makes in calling it food apartheid because there is this very real issue. And I was hoping if you could possibly talk about some of the work and the research that you did in San Jose and Vallejo and which were urban areas and a rural area such as Buta, Buta County. Is it Buta County? Is that how you pronounce it? Are you saying Butte County, maybe? Yes, Butte. Yes, Butte okay. County. That's all right. That's fine. I just went German with Max, and I'm not just going to... B-U-T-T-E. It must be Buta. <laughs> no, yeah, Buta is great too, right? <laughs> Butte County, um, right. <laughs> so basically what we've done in community, so our first work was done in Santa Clara County, Mm -hmm. And just so people have an idea of what this is, it is a county that used to be known for its orchards. It's where Cesar Chavez, who co-founded the United Farm Workers, got his start. It was very rich in, you know, plants and trees growing food. Now, you know it more Silicon Valley. It is where, you know, Adobe is based, HP, Apple, You know, Netflix, all the big companies are in Silicon Valley. And so I lived and I worked in San Jose, which is in Santa Clara County. And I lived and I worked in downtown. And I had two liquor stores across the street from each other where I lived and where I worked. And so I decided to see, you know, is this problem of lack of access to healthy foods happening here in this wealthy community? And so what we did is we got some volunteers and we surveyed comparing high income areas in the county and low income areas in the county. Mm -hmm. to assess the availability of healthy foods. And so we surveyed every establishment except for fast food and and restaurants. And um, what we found was in the higher income areas, there was 14 times more access to frozen vegetables in the lower income communities. We found that some of the grocery stores in the higher income areas were open 24 hours, whereas in the other communities may be closed at eight or nine o'clock. And again, this is where we found out that income was the biggest barrier to people accessing healthy foods. We then went into San Jose, which was the most impacted area, and did focus groups to determine from the community what the barriers they experienced were and some of the solutions. We put out reports for both of these, and um, we did a similar situation in Vallejo, California. Now, Vallejo is, it's not too far from, say, Oakland and Berkeley, San Francisco. It's more east than that, maybe east and north. Mm -hmm. 
So that community is very urban. It's in a rural county though. And so, but Vallejo itself is primarily Black, Latinx, and Filipinx. So we decided just to look at that community. And again, we established actually every single location except for fast food and um, restaurants. And here we found that the entire community was lacking access to healthy foods, but it was worse in black and brown communities. Here you had thousands of liquor stores, and this was primarily where people were getting their food. We did focus groups again. This time we did seven of them, uh, making sure we encompassed more of the community and found the same situation of people not being able to afford uh, the healthy foods. Wow. I mean, that's that's some extensive research that you've done there, which is absolutely great. But it's also, it's actually pretty damning evidence, isn't it? That this, this is exactly what's going on and that this is, there is this entirely discriminatory system that the food supply chains in the US and in, in a state like California, which has this, you know, the whole well-being kale smoothie and, you know, all yep. the tech companies are there. It, it, it's, it's a complete contrast to what the image of California might be to people who don't know and who just see it. Exactly. And I think that that is, it's actually also that it's in the Bay Area of California, right. which is very, like you said, health conscious, but also sees itself as very progressive. And yet we're allowing certain communities to suffer severe health consequences. Um, not only are they dealing with health consequences because of the lack of access to healthy foods, but many of these communities are also suffering because of environmental racism, which allows, you know, more toxic facilities to be in their backyards, which impacts their air quality, their soil quality, and things like that. So, yeah, it is incredibly pathetic and disgusting, um, and yet ironic that in such a community where we pride ourselves on healthy eating and organic and all this other stuff and also being progressive yet again lets down black brown and indigenous community members yeah and i imagine i mean it, what it comes across is that this is there is this double edged sword right so a, a lot of these diets that potentially have a lot of health benefits are inaccessible to black and brown and indigenous communities which means that, you know, if they have certain dietary restrictions or if they simply want to choose better or eat better, they don't have, they're not able to buy that produce. They don't have access to that produce. And on the other hand, if they do end up having any sort of ailments or illnesses, they have to navigate the entire field of medical racism and, and how they will not get access to the medical help that they may require from lack of proper nutrition. Exactly. is because most of them probably can't afford the health insurance. You know, mm -hmm. we, and if you consider many undocumented people don't have health insurance either. And there, a lot of these jobs that many of these people work at are low income because they are, they are the essential workers. They are farm workers or the people who've been doing fast food, working in the grocery stores. They're the ones who've been keeping us fed. And yet we yeah. provide them with very little protections. I also think it's important to mention that when we're talking about the, the irony of it all too, is that you have products that are actually better for our health being deprived to our community. So a lot of us are what is typically called lactose intolerant, meaning that those of us can't digest Dairy. the milk of another species, yeah. which is right. odd in and of itself. But those plant-based milks aren't available in these areas. Mm. So, you know, it's one of the things Food Empowerment Project calls it lactose normal, that there's nothing wrong with those of us who can't consume cow or goat milk when in fact that was a product of colonization. You know, for my ancestors' lands in the Americas, you know, it was Columbus who brought the cows over on the fourth voyage. It wasn't something that my ancestors consumed. So that's why many people in my communities can't digest it. And yet in these same communities, what's going to make them sick is cow's milk. And there's no plant milk available for them, which is going to be better for them, which then if you look at their kids, that has a whole problem when you talk about them studying and them feeling sick and then them feeling different. So yeah, it's, it's another legacy of colonization. I'm just wondering then that in terms of the alternatives to dairy and meat, you know, there's been so much innovation that the U.S. has done. You've got companies like Beyond Meat and you've got companies like Impossible Burgers and Memphis Meats and all of these different, you know, huge companies that are raising all of this money. And there's this 
surge that's happening towards the alternative protein industry and everyone's like, yes, this is great and this is a great way to reduce traditional meat consumption. Just how accessible are these alternatives to BIPOC communities? Yeah, I would say in the communities that we work in, they're not that available. In fact, we surveyed for that in Vallejo. And act- well, actually, we always survey for that. But yeah, they weren't very available. Right. And when you consider that many of these people living in these areas are primarily getting their groceries from liquor stores, these foods aren't available at the liquor mm. stores. You know, and that is something that we would love to start working on. Of course, we're, we're trying to work in general on increasing access to healthy foods in the community, but they don't have access to those either. And to some regard, I mean, that's like a step further, right? I mean, they don't even have access to fresh fruits and vegetables at this point in order to be vegan, much less them getting those types of benefits. And it's not to say that's not available anywhere in the community, because of course it is. But a lot of these people are taking a couple buses just in order to get to the grocery store. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not even a question at the point, because, you know, if you're going to make a Beyond Meat burger, you first need like the rest of the parts of the burger before you you can actually get. Yeah. Because otherwise, are you supposed to put tomato sauce on that burger? Because you can't find a fresh tomato, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's like, it's not even, so yeah, that's quite interesting because, you know, there's all this talk about how that's sort of the new frontier of vegan eating and really going to help change the system. But if it's going to just reproduce or sort of eliminate certain people who are already eliminated, then it's really not breaking any ground, at least at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I think that they know their niche. Their niche is those, what do they call flexitarians? Mm, yeah. You know, and that's the, it's great in the sense that this food is becoming more common, right? Like it's easier for me than it was 30 years ago because Absolutely. of the fact that it's more available. Absolutely. But to act like it's there going to be easier for people who don't have access to healthy foods, I think is not accurate. Yeah. And I think it's a little bit of a stretch. Yeah. But by all means, it's great to reduce the suffering of non-human animals for those people who normally consume them, but it may not necessarily be helping on this front. Yeah. And how has the Black Lives Matter trend, I mean, the movement's always been around, right? But then the trend is just, it's just sort of recaptured our attention and people are suddenly talking about it so much more. And there are a lot of activists that I follow on Instagram who are encouraging people to consciously and intentionally buy from black owned businesses. So how has that sort of affected the awareness or the work that you're doing in the food justice space? I don't know that it's really affected us, which is fine, but I would think that, I mean, we definitely, we hundred percent support Black Lives Matter The thing that my concern always is, is that a lot of the corporations that are talking about Black Lives Matter are not exactly keeping that way of thinking in their full supply chain. So as many corporations who are talking about Black Lives Matter, which is great, but how many of them are looking at really the root causes of some of the problems that impact Black lives? And that would be, are they paying their workers living wages? Are they giving them health care? Are they providing for them? Are they actually creating counseling or any giving them days off when a lot of these horrific situations are coming to light? How are they taking care of their own workers versus these existential black lives? Are they taking care of the black workers in their own business and how are they paying them? Also the, the black workers in their supply chains, the, the, the truck drivers, the, you know, quite frankly, the If they sell chocolate, the black lives that are being impacted in Western Africa, how are they making sure that those black lives are being protected? So I think that, again, I I worry about corporations and their, you know, PR, um, Mm -hmm. their great marketing schemes to make it seem like they're doing good on the outside. But what is it that they're doing internally? How does their board look? How do their higher corporate staff look? How are Mm -hmm. they representing black and brown people? So, you know, that's more where my mind goes is, is you know, really wanting to hold them accountable mm. a bit more. And in terms of black and brown people who may be owning restaurants or who may be sort of um, at the, you know, spearheading the vegan movement within their immediate community, there's been so much attention that they've received as well. You know, do you have any thoughts on how we can sustain that? You know, how essentially that can outlive our attention spans in a way. 
Absolutely. I think that it's a matter of promoting. I mean, a lot of people have the impression that the vegan movement is white and vegans always say that's not true, but well, mm. let's show it's not true. Let's start showing more black and brown people. You know, let's, let's amplify the voices of the black organizations, all the organizations that are really highlighting these issues that are done by black and brown people who actually get this stuff though. It's one thing to promote a black vegan. It's another thing to promote a black vegan who's calling out the social justice issues, who's talking about these harder, harder issues mm. for white vegans to hear. And I think that those are the ones who should be celebrated and promoted because they're putting themselves in an uncomfortable position. Our organizations are not getting the same type of funding that the white organizations get. So support these groups financially and with your voices. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting because when I look at the UK, I mean, so obviously in India, the conversation is very different when it comes to Black Lives yes. Matter. And our <laughs> issues that we have to talk about are like very, very different. But, you know, since you're talking about the US, I'm just sort of I'm talking about the UK, where a lot of this co-opting and cultural appropriation tends to happen, where the Black Lives Matter movement sort of got to for this issue where it was this white chef who actually published this recipe book, this cookbook called Thug Kitchen. And yes. um, everyone was just like, are you just making like chickpea stew and then, then just passing it off with, with using, you know, African-American vernacular English, which is A-B-E. Yeah, mm -hmm. And, and the, you're just co-opting it without actually giving credit to a wealth of people, a wealth of black and brown people, but specifically black people for this context yes. who have done, you know, heaps and heaps of work to propel this movement. Yep. No, I mean, what they did was despicable. And there's so many layers to their, what I would call treachery. And I don't feel like they still have done right. Yeah. You know, they should be donating all of their profits to either promote, well, I would say promote black chefs black cookbook authors, black organizations that promote veganism. They need to be giving back. And yeah, I mean, they knew what they were doing. Any claim to theirs that they didn't know what they were doing. But that's, you know, that's again, one of the thing when, when our foods are described as vegans as exotic, mm. you know, when really it's like food that we grew up with, that's our culture. And all of a sudden they make money off of it. And we've seen this time and time again. I remember at a vegan veg fest in Portland, Oregon, where somebody was selling homemade corn tortillas mm. and he was white. And I was like, so is, you know, like asking about like somebody Mexican or something, a part of it. And he was like, does that matter? And I was like, of course it matters. I mean, how could he not think it mattered? Yeah. You know, and it's like, but that's what happens, right? People all of a sudden, they quote unquote, discover our food and then they decide to make it. And because they're white and they have the financial privilege and they have, you know, just exposure privilege, then it takes off. And people, our chefs and our foods all of a sudden become something that, you know, is, isn't quite the same caliber or something, you know, that you have to, you know, sprinkle, sprinkle lavender seeds on or something mm -hmm. in order to make it worthwhile. And, you know, a lot of gentrification happens as well, right? Like in the UK, the same establishment that is black owned or brown owned and does, you know, ethnic food or their food, you know, it's ethnic food, which is like, that's how it's referred to, to other people. But if they make whatever food that is to their culture, the same thing, you know, and, and these communities are also places where, you know, the rent is lower. So white people tend to buy these places out, which is essentially gentrification. And they just move in there and they just get this industrial chic, minimalist decor going and sell the exact same food for like 10 times the price, you know, and it's considered part of the, the hipster, the edgy vibe. And it's, it's just such a con and people don't talk about this. Yeah. And they also then these, these businesses sometimes get tax breaks because they're going to be uplifting the community mm. that somehow, you know, that they're going to bring money into the community. And then they displace people um, who've lived there for generations. Right. And these people not only are being displaced because of higher rent, but also now they're having to pay more for food, which they used to get at that store for a lot cheaper because the person who ran that store actually understood what it was part to be of the community and they lived it and they understood it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it happens everywhere, huh? <laughs> Just... Yeah. No, definitely. <laughs> I mean, even in Copenhagen, there's this Michelin star restaurant called Noma. 
which, uh, you know, I've heard lots of rave reviews of. And on their menu, right, is this dish that serves red ants. And I mean, so this is different to the veganism movement. But right. in India, right. there is a region called the Basta region and the tribes of the Basta region, they used to conventionally eat ants because it was a great source of nutrition and protein for them. And, you know, the same thing, you know, if you went into the Basta region and you were, I don't know, white Danish person and they gave you ants, you'd be like, whoa, well, I'm not going to eat this, you know, but someone has actually massively profited, won three Michelin stars and is selling this dish for like, I don't know, a hundred or two hundred dollars or something like that, because it's a delicacy at his restaurant. Right. So it's 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 absolutely unfair and like you rightly said, treacherous for people, white people to profit off of this. You know, that's where it's it gets that's where it starts and that's where people need to actually reevaluate. Definitely. Yeah. When you think of colonization, at least in terms of in the Americas, which is what I'm more familiar with, is how the Europeans were bringing their food over because they didn't want to eat the food of the quote unquote savages. Mm. They didn't want to become like them. And yet now, you know, you have a full circle. Now our food is exotic and it's to be discovered by white people. Yet again, we're being discovered and our lands are being discovered. Everyone's still doing a Columbus. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's a great quote. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Moving on to the the COVID-19 pandemic, which you also talked a little bit about before, you know, how has that sort of brought to light? Because there have been massive disruptions in food supply chains all over the world. I mean, I'm familiar with the Indian landscape. I'm sure you can comment on what's going on in the States at the moment. So how has the COVID-19 pandemic brought to light the inequalities in the food system? You know, how, how has that sort of changed our definition of how we are currently consuming or if it has even changed our definition? Right. I think that's a great question. Um, I think that, you know, you had the fact that people weren't able to get the food that they were always used to getting. And then that's when they went to our little exotic stores to get food. But I, I, again, I'd like to think that maybe they realized maybe what it was like for other people. They might have more empathy and sympathy now. But I think you also had that, that almost everybody who is involved in bringing food to our tables were considered essential workers. The right. grocery store workers, mm-hmm. the fast food workers, the farm workers, delivery people, all some of the lowest paid people who tend to be black and brown and single women, single moms. And so I think that that was the interesting thing that to some degree, you still had the people who were only going to be thanking the essential workers of the doctors, doctors more so than the nurses, again, but nurses who are not also paid very well. But some people starting to recognize the grocery store workers, you know, and even some thought about farm workers finally. And that is, it wasn't overwhelmingly, right? You still had you know, workers in grocery stores being punched in the face when they had to tell people to wear masks and things like that. But I think that a lot of people who maybe see themselves as progressive but have only ever thought about certain workers all of a sudden were forced to look at who all of a sudden was being deemed an essential worker. And as we know, they're always essential workers. These people are always essential workers. And, and the, yet these are the workers who didn't get any type of increase in hazard pay. They don't make the same amount of money, not even close to what doctors make. But they were the ones putting themselves on a daily basis in harm's way so we could be fed. And um, I know that strayed from your question, but I think it's really important to look at what really happened and, and who we really have to thank for, for keeping us going during the pandemic. And do you think that moving forward, you know, what does the future of how we eat look like? Because there is this awareness and and it is growing by the day, but will this increased awareness of the inequalities in our food supply system actually bring about any long-term behavioral changes? You know, does it mean that we're going to start growing our own food or does it mean that we're actually going to support local not just when it's a hashtag. And do you think it's going to bring that about? I think that, again, probably the more privileged people, the more progressive people will start leaning that way more than they did before. I think for 
black, brown, indigenous people or people who ha don't have a lot of money, that's probably a way that they've always been thinking like, gosh, I wish I grew my own food or yeah. I could grow my own food. And some do grow their mm -hmm. own food to help make ends meet. So I think that that probably will increase for the general public. No, I think that they, they still want to pound their fist and get the food that they want as soon as they demand it. But yeah, I mean, overall, you know, we strongly feel that community level is the basis for where we should be thinking and growing and especially to protect each other and protect our communities. We would love more people growing their own food. For those people who, like myself, have never lived anywhere where there's actually land or a backyard or anything like that, you know, we'd like to see worker-owned cooperatives as well, which means that mm -hmm. You know, if I don't have the ability to grow my own food, then I want to be buying my food, not at a corporation that's going to make sure that it, the shareholders are always getting their cut, but a location to where the workers are from the community. They are vested in the benefit of that community. The money stays in the community. They're creating skills and entrepreneurial skills to last people a lifetime. And they're looking out for the community and they're looking out for the health of the community, the community to thrive. And those are the types of things I think we need to see more of, that there are more worker-owned cooperatives, grocery stores or otherwise, where the money is staying in the community. So the workers are actually making the profits. And that helps the community. And do you have any sort of um, recommendations as to what people and consumers can actually do to help make that a reality unit, you know, to help replicate that where it exists in, in some communities? Yeah, I mean, we, we do a community by community. And so, you know, we, we, well, we don't really want white people going into impacted communities, but we do want to help black and brown community members, indigenous people who want to have to want to work on healthier foods in their community. And we, you know, we have great contacts with a, a Mandela grocery in Oakland, California, that is willing to help people. And that's what we're hoping to get into Vallejo, the community we're working in. And that's exactly what we'd like to see more of. But there's always more things that people can do. We have on Food Empowerment Project's website, we do have like 15 tips for more ethical eating. I don't know how appropriate they are for everybody around the world, but certainly some of those would be helpful, I think, to everyone. Yeah, I mean, I've actually gone through your website pretty thoroughly and I, I really enjoyed it. I've really learned a lot. I know that you've got some really helpful lists as well, especially when it comes to chocolate, for instance, which companies are ethical and which ones are the ones to avoid or which ones are the ones who haven't provided any data. And I think that's a really excellent resource to have. And one of the questions I also wanted to ask you was, you've done this for 30 years and there's the slew of people who are entering this space as activists and um, and that's really inspiring but what comes with social media often is like you said when you put yourself out there you, you're vulnerable to any and all sort of opinions and sometimes that it results in you know some haters and trolls and whatnot so how do you actually sustain activism you know how do you actually sustain your drive and your motivation to do this for as long as you've done it and, and sort of not let it, and find that boundary between not letting it take a toll on your mental health, for instance. Well, I'd be lying if I was saying it didn't take a toll on my mental health because it absolutely and utterly has. And ironically, it only does when it comes from our own side. I can handle trolls and angry people when they're seeking to harm human or non-human animals. But when it comes from fellow vegans or activists who I consider colleagues, that's when it definitely impacts my mental health. But I'm not on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, but I pretty much follow cats. <laughs> cats, you know, other social justice groups that I like. But I'm not on social media very much. And I think that social media can be that double-edged sword where it can be help you feel less alone, but it can also be very damaging and can be very hurtful. Mm -hmm. And I just think that it's important that people don't feel they're obligated to anybody to follow them. They're not obligated to anybody to watch horrific videos. And you're not obligated to have people say horrible things to you on your social media. I believe very much so in blocking people. Mm -hmm. You don't need that. You don't deserve that. Don't do that to yourself. There's absolutely no reason to do that to yourself. You don't need to engage in anybody. And if these people say these things, just don't talk back to them. You don't know where it is where their anger is coming from, especially if you're a black or brown person. You don't know where that anger is coming from. So get rid of them. 
But I think it's just a matter of um, being patient with yourself, being kind with yourself. And these are things I'm still learning, right? Just because I've been doing this for so long doesn't mean I've done it right. It just means that my drive and passion to help make a difference in the world overrides sometimes my own mental health, which isn't great. But I think that making sure you've got close friends that you can talk to and that you're good to yourself and you do things that enrich yourself. And a lot of us, that is the fact that we care and we love and we want to make a difference. And even just reminding yourself in those small ways that you do it all the time. And I think you're remarkably brilliant. And um, I, if anybody ever said anything to you, I'd want to know so I could take them to task (laughs) because you're very, very, you, you add a sparkle to this world and your intelligence and your insight and your compassion is something I wish more people had. Yeah. I mean, you're talking generally, or you're sp- saying I'm talking to you. Oh, you're talking to me. Oh, that's I am talking. To you. Oh, oh my god, that was so lovely. I thought I was like a unanimous message to like the you, oh. the collective you. Well, I'm like, oh, that's, well, that's wonderful. That's, that's so beautiful. lovely of you to say. At last, this is virtually, and we're in COVID nineteen. I was giving you a big hug to say thank mm-hmm. you because it's been such an absolute pleasure speaking with you. You have come to this with so much grace and generosity. And I think that's really important because sometimes it can be very overwhelming because when you're new to a space, you know, and you're speaking to someone who's like a veteran activist, you can be like, oh, I, d- I don't understand all these issues. And I think it's, it's absolutely amazing that you have all of this patience and that you, you explain and you articulate the way that you do, which is, you know, free from jargon and free from like, the highbrow elitism that sometimes universities and (laughs) traditional educational spaces, you know, come true with. So I think I really appreciate that, Lauren. Thank you. I appreciate you. And you, um, yeah, you get this stuff. And I will say that this, your generation, you know, I feel like I, I fought as much as I could, but you all are definitely what is, I mean, you're always what gives me hope and you, you understand this so well. And I think a lot of people your age do. And um, it's so beautiful to see. And I'm so thankful for all of you just being ready to knock the system down. Yeah. And, and I think finally, if you could just talk about the ways in which people listening in can actually support FEP and your organization in general, that would be great. Sure. Well, we are always happy to have volunteers. We are on social media. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And so if you can share, if, unless you want to get off Facebook, which we fully support, <laughs> we encourage you to share our stuff and like it and follow us. Always donations are appreciated. We're a small organization and donations go a long way. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lauren. It's been such a blast speaking to you. I've had so much fun. I've learned a lot. And once again, the pleasure has been all mine to have you on here. So I really appreciate it once again. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. And I just... Look forward to learning from you and hearing from you more. And that marks the end of this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. You can find all the relevant links and handles to know more about our guest this week in the episode description. If you have any feedback, suggestions, requests, or simply just want to get in touch with us, then please do head over to our podcast website. We are available to flag and say hi to via Facebook, Instagram, or email. 